What I am going to um, say to you, I have nothing to disclose. I have no connection, no financial connection with any um, uh, pharmaceutical company. However, I am um, a member of CIS, and uh, all the uh, information that I'm going to provide to you on how to do a cervical radiofrequency neurotomy procedure comes from um, their second edition of their practice guideline for uh, uh, spinal uh, uh, procedures. Um, I have had the uh, luck of training here in Seattle with, in my opinion, one of the best interventionalists in America. His name is Ray Baker, and he has introduced me to what used to be called ISIS. At some point, they decided to, um, for, for obvious reasons, to change the name to CIS. Um, and uh, when I joined the um, society in 2014, I was wondering, you know, are they going to check uh, who the members of this ISIS society are. So anyway, so as you all well know, I don't need to repeat this to you, and I don't want, I don't want to make this too boring. Um, the cervical um, facet joints are true joints, planar synovial joints that are formed between the superior articular process of uh, one vertebra and the inferior articular process of the other vertebra. They are usually located behind the um, intervertebral foramen, as you can see on the picture on the right, uh, and uh, in the near proximity of the nerve that is um, contained within that neuroforamen. They have a volume capacity of no more than 0 0.5 to 1, millil of one milliliter. Um, they are usually innervated by the medial branch of the cervical spine nerve dorsal rami. And as you can see from the uh, cartoons on both the left and on the right, uh, those, middle, those middle branches can uh, curve or curve around the anterolateral, the lateral, and the posterolateral aspect of the ipsilateral articular pillar. You can see the articular pillar, what an articular pillar would look like on a lateral view on carton A and on um, 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 uh, on an AP view on the cartoon on the right side. I think it is important for you to have this picture in mind because I think that what I'm going to do next, I think, is the, one of the most important things that I'm going to tell you all day long, which is, besides this, which is, you know, you always do a cervical RFA after you have conducted two uh, medial branch red blocks with two different local anesthetics. And if you believe what all those uh, authors have said in these articles, you should perform an RFA after you have uh, obtained complete pain relief. None of the 50%, 75%, 80% complete pain relief, uh, even though it's very difficult to achieve that. And it's very difficult to have a true, purely uh, facet joint mediated pain in uh, many patients. So. 50, 75 percent has to be has to become an acceptable standard, as long as you speak to the patient ahead of time and explain to him what you are trying to achieve and whether or not that percentage of pain relief is acceptable to him or her. The important thing that I want to say to you is, if you think carefully of the cartoons that I showed you before, uh, the location of the medial branch obviously drives what the appropriate placement of the needle should be. And uh, the appropriate placement of the needle should be parallel to the plane of the joint. Uh, as you can see on uh, the image on the left, if you have a lateral view in uh, 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 figure C, you can see the uh, plane of the facet joint pretty clearly. Uh, and the needle that lies parallel to the plane of the facet joint on, on a lateral view. Uh, and the way that needle on uh, figure C is going to look when you are going to go on an oblique view um, on uh, uh, figure D. Uh, you see that the needle is right above the location of the nerve and is parallel to uh, the plane of that nerve, and then you are going to perform multiple um, uh, uh, 
denervating lesions along the plane of the nerve. Um, you can start any way you want. You can start with an oblique path, uh, which would be with needle insertion 30 degrees angle from the sagittal plane. Or you can start with, uh, using a sagittal path, uh, coming, uh, starting with a lateral view. It doesn't really matter which um, path you decide to choose. Choose the one that you are the most easy and familiar with. Uh, it's pretty clear that, uh, as Dr. Sesi was alluding before, check the lateral view. You always need to check a lateral view because you need to be with the tip of the needle posterior to the neuroforamen, posterior to the area where the nerve root lies. So starting with a lateral view would be the most logical um, starting um, uh, image to begin with. Um, but it doesn't really matter if you start with an oblique, using an, an oblique pad or using a lateral pad. Um, I've used both, and uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, Sometimes I start with an oblique path. Sometimes I start with a lateral path. Um, the important information that you need to have, if you want to start with a lateral path, you need to try to make sure that you have a true lateral view. And sometimes that is not easy to achieve. That's the reason why you want to have the patient lying down on the procedure table as comfortably as possible, having chest support, head support, so that you can try to um, use all the um, images that you can use and try to uh, take advantage of the head and chest support to try to help yourself um, obtain the best possible lateral, lateral view. Um, if you look at this image, basically you will look where the needle um, tip should be located for the uh, uh, optimal, uh, to have the optimal lo location for a medial branch nerve block at the C3, C6 level, and the, the C7 medial branch nerve level as well. Um, so the needle tips that are located in the dash parallelogram uh, are the uh, ap uh, appropriate needle tip location for medial branch nerve blocks at, and RFAs at the C3, C6 level, through C6 level. And uh, the needle tip that is located into the dash triangle, uh, as you can see on the image, is the um, appropriate and correct placement for a medial branch RFA at the C7 nerve level. As you can see, this is a lateral view, and see how well aligned the joint lines are, so that you have, uh, a, and as you can see how basically the needle for all those uh, possible um, the innervation lesions uh, is going to be located parallel to the plane of the um, facet joint. Um, here you can see uh, needles that are places for uh, um, the um, um, performance of the RFA at the C5 medial branch nerve level. You can see on uh, figure A a lateral view, this is the needle that has been placed through an oblique pass. Remember, an oblique pass is 30 degrees from the sagittal view. Uh, and you can see that the tip of the needle is located uh, uh, behind the posterior margin of the foramen at that particular level. And on an AP view, you can see how the tip of the needle is located parallel to, to the location of the um, Nerve, and you can see that the little circle identifies the location where the second lesion can be performed at that particular level for that particular uh, nerve at the waist of the articular pillar at the C5 level. Um, this is instead uh, is the same uh, location with the needle that has been placed using the sagittal pass. Uh, so starting with a lateral view, and you can see on uh, the lateral view on image A, uh, picture A, how the tip of the needle is still located onto the posterior uh, aspect of the um, neuroforamen at that particular level. And uh, you can see on image B how the tip of the needle is located below 
the area where the second needle, uh, where the second uh, lesion can be performed for the needle branch nerve uh, at that particular level. Um, for the C7 medial branch level, these are uh, uh, the way it would um, sketches of the uh, needle placement uh, for the C7 uh, medial branch uh, RFA. You can see on uh, uh, um, figure A a ladder view of what the needle placement at that particular level would look like. And on image B, you see an AP view where you see the needle that are places uh, 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 and are located against the lateral surface of the superior articular process and across the top of the transverse process at the C7 vertebra. And you can see uh, from these images what this would look like on uh, uh, X-ray, which is exactly uh, what it looks like in, in this picture. Um, the uh, image on the right is a lateral view that looks pretty much like, sorry, looks pretty much like, uh, I apologize, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That looks exactly what it would look on image A. And uh, uh, the figure on the right and the figure on the left is what it looks uh, on, uh, on, on figure B. Um, for the third occipital nerve, um, the location of the third occipital nerve, um, as you can see on the image on the left, um, the third occipital nerve is embedded into the pericapsular uh, fascia of the C23 facet joint. And um, on uh, image number B, you see, uh, image B, excuse me, you see uh, what the target points for um, uh, the location of the needle for the third occipital nerve injection uh, um, look like they, uh, those target points uh, lie um, along a vertical line that bisects the, the C23 facet joint line. Um, this is the lateral view that shows the correct placement uh, of a needle uh, in the middle of the uh, three portions that are necessary for you to block the third occipital nerve and the two little uh, white dot are the targets for the um, uh, placement of other uh, needle for um, uh, blocking and eventually denervate the third occipital nerve. Uh, this is what a placement of the needle for the third occipital nerve uh, RFA uh, would look like with uh, on lateral view for A, B, and C with the needle that is placed in uh, high position for uh, figure A in the middle position for figure B and in low position for uh, figure C. And you can see all on the lateral view how the tip of the needle for all three targets lies uh, behind the posterior margin of the um, corresponding um, neuro foramen. And the same images for uh, our for um, uh, in, in an AP view, high position, mid, and low position. Um, a few notions of physics. Uh, when you perform an RFA, uh, usually the volume of the tissue that is coagulated by the RFA lesion takes, uh, assumes an elliptical shape in longitudinal section and the circular shape in a transverse section. Usually the recommended temperature for denervating uh, uh, the medial branch nerves uh, are between 80 and 90 degrees Celsius for 90 to uh, 120 seconds. Um, there is enough evidence, however, to show that after 90 seconds, uh, further growth of the lesion is limited because the coagulated tissues that has, the tissue that has already been coagulated uh, represents, uh, uh, shows, has an increasing resistance to the flow of the current. Um, it has uh, become more of common practice to use cool RFA devices and perform cool RFA procedures. Um, cooling uh, uh, 
um, cause low impedance around the el electrode, and that is usually um, um, achieved by uh, using water that is passed through a specific channel that is, co is incorporated within the electrode. Low impedance allows um, alternating current to eat uh, the tissue longer, to coagulate the tissue longer, and um, enable you to coagulate a larger volume of tissue as well. Um, the electrode temperature is between 45 and 50 degrees Celsius, and um, it is evident that uh, uh, cool RFA electrodes can produce lesions that are and that extend more distally than usually those uh, the, uh, produced by um, uh, traditional RFA machines. Um, usually, the uh, what does a um, an RFA uh, cause for onto the medial branch nerve? It coagulates the proteins in situ and without breaching the nerve. Usually, you recover from uh, a radiofrequency ablation procedure because there are endocellular mechanisms that end up clearing the coagulated proteins within the axons. Usually, uh, pain relief persists as long as the nerve is coagulated, but once the nerve, repaired, uh, once the nerve is repaired, the conduction resumes and pain can, be, uh, recur, can recur again. Uh, you need to try to uh, maximize your effort to increase the length of the nerve coagulated. That's the reason why using the a cool um, a technique may be uh, appropriate. That's why uh, performing more than just one lesion may be a, a, an appropriate way to, to proceed. Uh, in my personal experience, um, I have had patients that I have uh, uh, performed RFA for with two or three uh, lesions and they have had uh, an average duration of the procedure once the patient has been chosen correctly, an average of 12 to 18 months. Um, what are the possible hazards and complications that you can have? You can cause injury to the spinal cord, uh, particularly if the electrodes are placed medial to the joints and inside the vertebral canal. Um, so always check your position regardless of uh, which um, approach and path you want to use to begin with. Uh, the lateral view is key here. You really need to place the tip of the needle as the final needle placement behind the uh, posterior margin of the neural frame. And obviously, you are going to test and make sure that you are not um, uh, stimulating areas that you do not want to be stimulated. You can cause injury to the spinal nerves, per se, and to the vertebral artery if the electrodes are placed too far ventrally or are anterior to the target zone for the cervical uh, medial branch. You are inevitably going to denervate the cervical musculature. Uh, and um, uh, to some degree, you to, and actually, if you have performed the procedure in correctly from the technical point of view, the only way that you have to understand uh, mechanism that you have to understand whether the procedure has been performed technically in the correct ways would, is, would be to do, um, even though, of course, you are not going to do that, but would be performing a nerve conduction study of the, uh, at that particular level, and you will find that there is a denervation of the multifidized muscles at that particular level. Uh, Denervating cervical muscular, mu musculature can cause a lot of muscle weakness and uh, uh, neck dropping and, and uh, issues like that. So you want to limit the number of uh, nerves that you are going to coagulate to not, 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 not more than three. I'm not a huge fan of doing bilateral more than three. If, if I can limit uh, to one side per time, I am more than happy doing that. Uh, with the third occipital neuronomy, there, are, um, there is evidence that some patients may develop ataxia. And if you develop ataxia, some of these patients may develop permanently ataxia. So you, don't, you want to avoid doing third occipital neuronomy bilaterally. You want to start with one side first. That's it.